The Theology of Christian Perfection Part 8 Complementary Questions From all that we have said, certain important conclusions can be drawn. We shall explain briefly the principal ones which are necessary for understanding the true nature of mysticism. First Conclusion the mystical act and the mystical state are not identical. The mystical experience is produced by the actuation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit through their divine modality, which is completely alien to our human psychology. Consequently, there is a mystical act, more or less intense, as often as any gift of the Holy Spirit operates in the soul. The actuation of a gift in the divine matter, which is the only possible mode of operation for a gift, will give to the soul, if nothing prevents it, a passive experience of the divine which is more or less intense and constitutes from a psychological point of view the most frequent and ordinary phenomenon in mysticism. But it is evident that an isolated actuation of the gift of the Holy Spirit does not suffice to constitute the mystical state. A state is of itself something fixed, stable, permanent, and habitual. It is incompatible with weakness and transitory acts. There is no mystical state until the actuation of the gifts is so intense and frequent that this operation predominates over the simple exercise of the infused virtues in a human mode. It is evident that the expression mystical state must be understood correctly. Since the mystical state consists in the predominance of the rule of the gifts, that expression cannot be understood in an absolute manner, but only in a relative manner. It is not a question of psychological state which is habitual in the proper sense of the word, but only of a predominant mode of operation. The mystical state, understood as a permanent and habitual mode of action without any kind of interruption, is never verified. The gifts of the Holy Spirit do not act continuously and uninterruptedly in any mystic, to be sure, they operate in the soul of the mystic in a manner that is increasingly intense and more frequent, but never in a permanent and uninterrupted manner. The reason is evident. For the operation of the gifts, a special motion of the Holy Ghost is required in each case, because he alone can actuate them directly and immediately. This motion corresponds to the movement of the actual graces, which are of themselves transitory. Therefore, when theologians and mystics speak of the mystical state, they use the word state in its wide sense, meaning the habitual state of the simple predominance of the gifts. This means that ordinarily and habitually, the acts of the gifts predominate over personal initiative which, with the help of grace, would put the infused virtues to exercise in a human manner. Understood in this sense, the expression is true and exact and has the advantage of conveying the idea of a soul that lives most of the time under the rule of movement of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Reducing this distinction to precise formulas, we would offer the following definition. The mystical act is the simple actuation, more or less intense, of a gift of the Holy Spirit operating in a divine manner. The mystical state is the manifest predominance of the activity of the gifts operating in a divine manner over the simple exercise of the infused virtues operating in a human manner. Second conclusion. There is a distinction between mysticism and infused contemplation. 
Many authors speak of these two things as if treating of one in the same reality. But if we are to speak precisely, they are not only distinct but separable. There can be no infused contemplation without mysticism, since contemplation is the mystical act par excellence, but there can be mysticism without infused contemplation. The reason for this apparent paradox is very simple. All theologians agree in stating that infused contemplation is produced by the intellectual gifts, especially the gifts of wisdom and understanding, and not by the effective gifts. This is common doctrine. Now one or another of the effective gifts, such as the gift of piety, could be actuated and thereby produce a mystical act in a soul without causing infused contemplation, which proceeds only from the intellectual gifts. And there is no contradiction in saying that these acts of the effective gifts could be multiplied and intensified to such a point that the soul would be introduced into the mystical state without having experienced, at least not in a clear and evident manner, the habitual activities of contempl contemplative prayer. Such was the case, in our opinion, with T Saint Therese of Lisieux, who was a mystic because she possessed completely by the Holy Spirit. The gift of piety was manifested in her to an extraordinary degree, but this gift is an effective gift, and is incapable in itself of producing contemplation. It is necessary to remark, however, that this is not usual in the lives of the saints. Ordinarily they did not enter the mystical state in a full and perfect degree, without also receiving infused contemplation. The reason is that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are intimately connected with charity, and then they grow together with it proportionately like the fingers on the hand. Consequently, although it is possible to have perfectly mystical acts which are not contemplative, because of the actuation of a effective and not an intellectual gift, it is difficult to see how the soul should enter into the full mystical state without ever enjoying the activity of the intellectual gifts which produce infused contemplation. Even in those saints in whom the effective gifts predominate, predominated, infused contemplation was experienced from time to time. Saint Therese herself confessed to her sister, Mother Agnes of Jesus, that she had frequently enjoyed the prayer of quiet, which is the second degree of infused contemplation according to St. Teresa, and that she experienced a flight of the spirit, which is a contemplative phenomenon, as explained by St. Teresa of Avila. Third conclusion. Asceticism and mysticism are so intermingled that there is never a purely ascetical state, or a purely mystical state. Sometimes the ascetic proceeds mystically, and the mystic ascetically. The ascetical state is that in which the ascetical acts predominate. The mystical state is that in which mystical acts predominate. This is a conclusion which follows from the doctrine as we have already seen and explained it. The gifts of the Holy Spirit can, can act during the ascetical state and produce transitory mystical acts, although they may be weak and almost insensible because of the perfect, imperfect disposition of the soul. On the other hand, mystical souls even those who have arrived at transforming union sometimes need to proceed in the manner of ascetics because at a given moment they do not experience the supernatural influence of the holy cross 
St. Teresa speaks of this when she says there is no state of prayer so lofty that it is not necessary to return to the beginning, and when she says to her nuns that sometimes our Lord leaves the natural order, even those souls who have arrived at the sublime heights of the seventh mansion of the interior castle. This same doctrine is clearly stated by Father Arantero. What truly constitutes the mystical state is the predominance of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and their consequences, the mature and ripe fruits of the Beatitudes. Over simple ordinary vivified faith, with its corresponding works in hope and charity, the predominance of the latter over the former characterizes the ascetical state. But sometimes the good ascetic, moved by the Holy Spirit, can proceed mystically, although he may not advert to it, and so also, on the other hand, the mystics, however elevated they may be, when the Holy Ghost withdraws from them for, a, for some time, although he leaves them rich in great affections and fruits, which give their actions greater intensity and value, must proceed and do proceed after the manner of ascetics. Thus the soul that still proceeds by the most ordinary paths may sometimes produce truly mystical acts, just as a mystic on many occasions produces ascetical acts, and those acts increase until little by little, purified and illumined, they become habitual. When this happens, when the soul habitually produces acts of virtue and, denying itself, ordinarily permits itself to be moved without resistance by the touching and breathing of the sanctifying spirit who, as with a very delicate musical instrument, handles the soul as he wishes and draws from it divine melodies, then we can say that the soul is now in the full mystical state, although from time to time he will still have to return to the ascetical state. Fourth Conclusion Mysticism is not an extraordinary grace similar to the graces gratis date. Christians may participate in it to some degree, even in the early stages of the spiritual life. This consequence is nothing more than a corollary and confirmation of the former con conclusion. If in the simple ascetic there are some sometimes produced truly mystical acts, and if the mystic must sometimes descend to ascetical activity, it follows that there is no definitive barrier between asceticism and mysticism. The passage from one to the other is a normal and insensible one, since the mystic is disguised, is distinguished from the, from the ascetic only by the predominance of certain actions, which already begin to occur, although rarely and with small intensity, at the very beginnings of the Christian life. Father Arantero sets forth the proposition in this way. Since the gifts are infused in greater or lesser degree with sanctifying grace, and since they grow with charity, all who live in charity can operate heroically and mystically through the gifts, and thus, even in a remiss state, in the beginning of the spiritual life, the mystical life begins, and it embraces the whole development of the Christian life. And the whole path of evangelical perfection, although its principal manifestations are reserved almost exclusively for the united, unitive way in which the soul possesses, as it were, the habit of heroism and of the divine in which, exercising with perfection even the most difficult practice of virtue, the soul clearly operates in a superhuman manner.
This doctrine gives the Christian life all of the grandeur and sublimity which we admire in the primitive church, where the Christian spirit attained a maximum degree of splendor. In the first centuries of Christianity, the supernatural, understood as synonymous with heroic or superhuman, was the normal atmosphere for the Church of Christ. It was only later, when the complications and divisions were introduced, that the ways of the Lord, simple in themselves, became confused. The epoch of the greatest confusion began in the seventh century and extended to the beginnings of our own century, in which there was a reaction and a strong return to the traditional mystical doctrine. Today, the truth has been so strongly established that there are few spiritual writers of any authority who would dare to present the mystical life as an abnormal and extraordinary phenomenon, which is reserved only for a small group of the elite. The majority maintain that there is no impassable barrier between asceticism and mysticism. There are not two distinct paths which lead to Christian perfection. On the contrary, there are but two stages of the same path to perfection which all should travel until they reach sanctity. 3. Mysticism and Christian Perfection one of the most controversial questions among the various schools of spirituality is the relationship between mysticism and Christian perfection. Theologians are divided into two principal opinions concerning this important question. The first opinion holds for the unity of the way in the spiritual life, considering asceticism and mysticism as two phases of the same path which all souls ought to travel on the way to perfection. The ascetic phase serves as a basis and preparation for the mystical phase in which alone is found the full perfection of the Christian life. The second opinion maintains a duality of ways the one ascetical and the other mystical, and by either one the soul can arrive at Christian perfection, but in such wise that the ascetical way is the normal and common way according to the ordinary providence of God, and is therefore the way which all souls should strive to follow. The mystical way is completely abnormal and extraordinary. The exceptional importance of this question should be evident to all, not only as a theoretical question, but in the practical order, since the solution to this problem in their speculative order will determine to a great extent the direction which should be given to souls in their progress towards sanctity. The first thing that we must do is clarify the state of the question, because not all authors understand the terms in the same way. In the first place, some authors believe that the problem consists in determining whether or not there are various kinds of sanctity determined by the development of various kinds of sanctifying grace. But this is not the question in dispute. Sanctifying grace is one, both for those who affirm and those who deny the unity of the spiritual life, because there is not nor can there be any kind of participation in the divine manner which would be more perfect without ceasing to be so in an accidental manner. It is not a question therefore, of determining whether there exists in the mystical way of sanctifying grace, which is specifically 
distinct from the grace of the ascetical way. On this sense, theologians admit the unity of the spiritual life, since the grace is one, the faith is one, and the charity is one, and these constitute the spiritual life from beginning to end. Neither is it a question of determining whether there exists in the mystical way, or in it alone, a call to perfection which is known in the ascetical way, or to put the matter more clearly, it is not a question of trying to discover whether all souls, mystics or not, are called to Christian perfection. All the schools of spirituality would answer this question in the affirmative. What is disputed is whether this perfection falls exclusively under the dominion of the mystical way, or whether it can be attained without leaving the boundaries of the ascetical way. Finally, we are not attempting to verify the question de facto, whether they are many or few who actually reach the mystical stage, but only the question de jour, that is, whether the mystical states enter into the normal development of sanctifying grace, or whether it is the effect of an extraordinary providence absolutely outside the common ways, which are open to all Christians who possess grace. Having isolated the false interpretations of the problem, let us now put the question in its true focus. All are called to Christian perfection. Perfection, or the development of grace and the virtues in the soul, is the terminus of the spiritual life. To reach this perfection, it is necessary that the soul experience mystical operations, or can the soul attain perfection without having experienced these things? In other words, are the ascetical and mystical phases two parts of one and the same path which lead to the terminus of the spiritual life, the perfection of charity? Or are there two different paths which lead to the same terminus? As is evident, the question does not pertain to the beginning or the end of the spiritual life. Neither in one nor the other can there be any specific dif difference, since grace and charity cannot be otherwise than essentially one. The question refers to the means by which one can reach the terminus of his path, the perfection of charity. It is a question concerning the unity of the spiritual way, rather than the unity of the spiritual life. Mysticism and Perfection Keeping in mind the principles which we have established, it seems to us that the principal relations between Christian perfection and mysticism can be synthesized in the following conclusions. First conclusion. Mysticism enters into the normal development of sanctifying grace. This conclusion should be evident in view of the doctrine already explained. There are three elements intermingled in this conclusion. Grace, its normal development, and mysticism. We have said that sanctifying grace is given to us in the form of a seed by which its very nature demands an increase in growth. This is so clear that it is admitted by all the different schools of Christian spirituality. If grace were infused in the soul, already perfectly developed, the obligation to strive for perfection would be meaningless and absurd. We know also what mysticism is, the actuation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in a divine mode, and usually producing a passive experience of the divine. This point is also admitted by all theologians, with certain differences to be sure, but these do not affect the substance of the matter. 
Those who deny the universal call to mysticism will suggest the possibility of a human mode in the operation of the gifts or some other subterfuge, but all admit substantially that mysticism is produced by the divine modality of the gifts. There is also agreement among all schools concerning the meeting of the normal development of sanctifying grace. Whatever falls within the exigencies of grace evidently falls within its normal and ordinary development, and whatever is outside the exigencies of grace will be abnormal and extraordinary in its development. On this also all theologians are in agreement. Who can deny that the simple actuation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit falls within the normal exigencies of grace? Who would say that the simple actuation of a gift of the Holy Ghost is an abnormal and extraordinary phenomena in the life of grace? As a matter of fact, no one has ever dared to say such a thing. All the schools of Christian spirituality recognize that the simple actu actuation of the gift of the Holy Spirit cannot be classified among extraordinary phenomena, as one would classify, for example, the graces gratis de te. But it is something perfectly normal and ordinary in the life of grace. And precisely because they are aware of the inevitable consequences which follow this evident fact, those who deny the universal call to mysticism are forced to say that the gifts of the Holy Spirit can operate in two ways. The human mode, which does not transcend the ascetical phase, and the divine mode, which is characteristic of and proper to the mystical phase. Consequently, they include the actuation of the gifts of the Holy Ghost, enters into the normal and ordinary development of grace, but that mysticism does not necessarily enter into this normal development, because the actuation of the gifts, according to their theory, can be explained by a human mode of operation which could occur in the ascetical phase. This explanation would be incontestable if it were true, but in our opinion it is completely false. We have already demonstrated that the gifts of the Holy Ghost do not and cannot act in a human mode. This human manner of operation is absolutely incompatible with the very nature of the gifts. We have already seen that such a manner of operation, besides being useless and superfluous, is philosophically impossible, for it would destroy the very nature of the habits. It is theologically absurd, because it would destroy the very nature of the gifts. Consequently, either the gifts do not operate, or they necessarily operate in a divine manner. Then we are in the domain of the mystical, because the actu actuation in a divine mode necessarily produces a mystical act, although we admit a variety in, it, in its intensity and duration. In the ascetical state, the gifts rarely operate, and when they do, it is only imperfectly and with little intensity, due to the imperfect disposition of the soul. But the human, superhuman mode of the gifts is surely present even in this case, although in a weak and latent manner, as Father Garagou Lagrange puts it, the whole manner is reduced to the fact that the soul, with the aid of grace, disposes itself more and more for the more intense and more frequent actuation of the gifts. <laughs>
these gifts do not have to change specifically and they do not need anything else to be added to their nature it suffices merely that the latent and imperfect exercise of the gifts in the ascetical state be intensified and multiplied in order that the soul gradually enter into the full mystical state whose essential characteristics consi consists of the predominance of the actuation of the gifts of the Holy Ghost in a manner divine over the simple exercise or predominance of the infused virtues in a human manner. This explanation, which is demanded by the very nature of things, seems to us to be the only logical explanation until our adversaries can show us that the simple actuation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is an extraordinary phenomena in the life of grace and we are certain that they will never be able to do that we shall rest secure that our position is invulnerable second conclusion complete Christian perfection is found only in the mystical life. This is another conclusion which follows from the theological principles which we have already established. Christian perfection consists in the full development of that sanctifying grace received at baptism as a seed. This development is verified by the increase of the infused virtues both theological and moral, especially that of charity, the virtue par excellence, whose perfection coincides with the perfection of the Christian life. But the infused virtues cannot attain their full perfection except under the influence of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, for without the gifts they cannot go beyond human modality under the rule to reason which to which they are restricted in the ascetical state only the divine modality of the gifts give the infused virtues the atmosphere which they need for their perfection it is this predominance of the activity of the gifts of the spirit operating in a divine mode however, which characterizes the mystical state. We have already demonstrated the truth of these statements, and from them our conclusion follows with the logical force of a syllogism. The infused virtues cannot reach their full perfection without the influence of the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating on them in a divine manner. But this actuation of the gifts of the Holy Ghost in a divine manner constitutes the very essence of mysticism. Therefore, the infused virtues cannot attain their full perfection from outside the mystical life. But if Christian perfection coincides with the perfection of the infused virtues, and especially that of charity, if these virtues cannot attain their perfection except in the mystical life, it follows that Christian perfection is impossible outside the mystical life. This conclusion, almost forgotten during the last three centuries of decadence in mystical theology, has once again received its proper place among the authors of modern spirituality. There are few theologians of the authority who insist on preserving the doctrines formerly held, and there are none who can offer a solid argument against this doctrine. Let us review the teaching of the three greatest lights in experimental mysticism, St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, and St. Francis de Sales, whose doctrines are in complete accord with the teachings of the angelic doctor. The teaching of St. John the Cross, if studied in its totality,
is oriented to mysticism as a normal and indispensable terminus for the attainment of Christian perfection. Of course, if one concentrates on an isolated text in Adam, it would be easy to defend any preconceived thesis, but it would not represent the authentic thought of St. John of the Cross. If a person reads his works without any preconceived notions, it will be evident that he teaches that one cannot attain Christian perfection except on the foundation of the passive purifications. The following two texts clearly indicate this thought. As regards certain apparent contradictions in the writings of St. Teresa, she herself explains all precision the true meanings of her words. The following passage is an example of her clarification. I seem to have been contradicting what I had previous said, since, in consoling those who had not reached the contemplative state, I told them that the Lord has many different roads by which they may come to him, just as he also had many mansions. Now I repeat this. His Majesty, being who he is and understanding our weaknesses, has provided for us. But he did not say, Some must come by this way, and others by that. His mercy is so great that he has forbidden none to strive to come and drink from this fountain of life. Note the importance of this passage for the understanding of the authentic teaching of St. Teresa. It is the saint herself who realizes perfectly that what she has just stated seemed to involve a contradiction of her previous teaching. Consequently, she attempts to clarify her thought by giving an authentic interpretation of her own words. Speaking with great care, she tells us that the Lord invites us, all of us, to drink the clear and crystal waters of mystical contemplation. No defender of the universal call to mysticism could have expressed the doctrine with greater clarity. At the risk of an arbitrary denial of St. Teresa's obvious teaching, one cannot deny that she is decidedly of the opinion that all are called to mysticism. As regards the teaching of St. Francis de Sales, one can study the beautiful commentary by Father Lembal on the treatise on the love of God, where St. Francis states, states that prayer is called meditation until it produces the honey of devotion and after this it is changed into contemplation meditation is the mother of love but the contemplation is her daughter holy contemplation is the end and terminus to which all those exercises tend and all of them are reducible to it this sublime doctrine of St. Thomas Aquinas, St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, and St. Francis de Sales are also the teachings of St. Bonaventure, St. Catherine of Siena, Eckhart, Tauler, Suso, Roisbrek, Brosius, John of Avila, and of all the mystical theologians previous to the 17th century, which begins the age of decadence. In modern times, there has been a return to this traditional doctrine on the mis mystical life, and so we can mention the following as examples. Marmion, Lehode, Louis Met, Stoltz, Gardiel, Gar Garagou Lagrange, Arentero, Jorit, Philippon, Peralto, Bruno of Jesus and Mary, Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene, de la Tele, Jager, Scrivener's, Cairé, Mercier, Sandro, and Maritain. In a word, most of the great names in modern Christian spirituality have returned, after a period of three centuries, to the sublime concept of the mystical life
as the normal culmination of the life of grace. Third conclusion, all are called, and at least by a remote and sufficient call, to the mystical state. To deny the universal call to the mystical life, it would be necessary to deny also the universal call to perfection. If God does not wish all of us to be perfect, then it is evident that he does not wish all of us to be mystics. But if the call to perfection is absolutely universal, and this is so clear that all the schools admit it, it is necessary to say that the call of the mystical life is likewise universal. Nevertheless, in spite of the fact that the questions de jour is beyond all doubt, we do not think it inconvenient to make some practical restrictions. Here, as everywhere, if one wants to remain in the area of truth and avoid all extremes, there is no other remedy but to make a distinction between the juridical order and the order of facts. The questions du jour have hardly ever coincide completely with the questions de facto, especially in these gray matters in which our human limitations and weaknesses play such a great part. We think that the most balanced and most realistic doctrine that has been offered today concerning the universal call to the mystical state is that of Father Garrigou Lagrange. His magnificent chapter on the call to contemplation and mystical life and in Christian perfection and contemplation could be accepted as a point of convergence for all the schools of spirituality, and we strongly urge the reader to study this chapter with great care. In practice, it seems, the true solution of the problem can be stated in the following propositions. 1. By a remote and sufficient call, by the very fact of being in the state of grace, all are called to the mystical life as the normal expression of sanctifying grace. As the child is called to maturity by the mere fact of being born, so as regards the mystical life, since grace is the seed of mysticism. If the soul is faithful and places no obstacles on the plans of God, a moment will arrive in which the remote call is converted into a proximate, sufficient call through the presence of the three signs stipulated by Towler and St. John of the Cross. The reason is that, as habits, the gifts of the Holy Ghost demand an operation which is more and more vital. 3. The proximate sufficient call becomes a pro proximate efficacious call if the soul, on receiving the first call, corresponds faithfully with it. And 4. The greater or less degree of holiness which the soul will attain in the mystical life will depend on the degree of fidelity on the part of the soul and the free determination of God in view of the degree of sanctity to which souls have been predestined, the degree of grace and glory is determined by God for each one by divine presentation. It would be noted that this doctrine is true, whether predestination is effected as Thomists maintain, ante previsa merita, or in the Molinist school teaches, post previsa merita.